Welcome to E-Town, Brother Ali. So, so glad you're here. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. You know, uh, it's these, these themes, your first couple songs, just, you know, we are who we are because somebody loves you and uh, what hearts are made for, what hearts are really, you know, for. Uh, these are beautiful themes. Mm. And I love the fact that uh, you're having fun, you're, you're entertaining people, but you're also sharing this kind of quest. You're on this spiritual journey. You're, you're looking for... Uh, Enlightenment, but you're also looking for fairness and standing up for injustice. And right. They're absolutely connected. Yeah. They're absolutely connected. The fight for justice, justice essentially means that things are in their proper balance and proportion. And so, uh, you know, I'm an activist and an organizer and all of those things. And um, it's very, sometimes it can be very alluring and easy to demand justice in the world and to, man, to demand that people be justly dealt with in the outside world. Especially when the outside world is so so overtly and uh, you know unpo- unapologetically evil and corrupt in a time like what we have right now, it's very easy to to see all of the evil in these people, uh, you know, that are in, in power. What can be more difficult is to demand that I'm just to myself, yeah. and to demand that I'm just to the people around me, and to demand uh, and and really heal to the point where the heart starts to. Yeah really be in a good balance and a good alignment. Because if you're, you have a choice, ultimately, over what your experience is going to be, you can be shocked by what's going on. You can be offended by what's going on. But if you're really in touch with your heart, you have that choice to have your own, whatever, whatever that experience is that you want to create in that moment, right? We should be very shocked and offended. Like, yeah. I mean, that's a, that's a human reality. That yeah. it would be, our hearts would be, have to be completely dead to watch uh, you know, young black men be killed in the street every day by right. you know, paid officers of the state. And the only thing they have in common is that they're black. Um, you know, for, uh, we would have to really be dead. Or have had experienced hundreds of years of trauma. Right. You know, trauma stores in the body and it stores inside mm-hmm. of us. And we actually inherit it from the people that came before us. Yeah. And so trauma causes people to either fight or flight or freeze. So if you think about the fact that you know, the black community has 400 plus years of being traumatized and being victimized that causes a fight and a flight. Also, European American people have hundreds of years of the people in power uh, mutilating human bodies and attacking human beings and dehumanizing human beings. And the heart doesn't like that. The human heart doesn't like seeing that. Mm -hmm. But for hundreds of years, European American people knew that if I say anything or if I do anything, I could be next. And so there's a, there's in the European American community, there's a, there's a, uh, a, a shutting down that happens. There's a freezing that happens. So when we see those things, like, I don't know what to do. You know what I mean? And so the healing of the hearts is really the beginning of all of this stuff. Right. Yeah. And it's funny because you know, you know, this is, you're very passionate about this, and yet in, in the songs we were just talking about, this is really an invitation to connect on this heart level as common, common ground. You know? Well, I, So my whole thing is like, I, I don't plan these things out strategically. I'm not a strategist in any form yeah. or fashion. Um, I'm not sure where I'm going to be tomorrow. Yeah. And it's not just because I'm on tour. Like, I yeah. legitimately don't know what city I'm going to be. I'll be in Denver, actually. But... Um, <laughs> At Cervantes. But I mean, after that, I don't, you know what I'm saying? I I literally don't know. I can't really remember how long it's been. You know, I'm not a strategist. But I report what's happening inside my heart. And then when people, you know, relate to that, then we have something very beautiful. Let me ask you a little bit about where this started, because I know that um, that you've been you've been writing just from your songs. I get some stories like uh, your song, Pray For Me. You write about a time when your mother wanted to help uh, you fit in, I guess, mm-hmm. by, by helping you change your hair color or whatever. Right? Yeah. My mother, we don't know her. I just did the Ancestry.com thing where you spit. You just got to fill a thing like this big with spit, yeah. which is like no problem until you realize like every spit is so small. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Unless it's in your food. Then it's like, oh. But like trying to fill that thing with spit That's takes a, lot a of spit. long time. Yeah. yeah. And you would think a rapper would be used to spitting. But, right. Uh, so I filled this thing up, and my mother was adopted, so we don't know what she was, but she was a dark-haired woman. She was adopted by Norwegian people in, in the Midwest, in the upper Midwest, and so she dyed her hair to, to blend in. So when I started going to school, the people, the kids at school used to ridicule me for being albino and, you know, 
what it means to walk into a room and be physically unacceptable to people right. was something that she wasn't used to. So she dyed her hair because she already basically was a pretty white lady that could blend into her family, into a community, just change the hair to blonde and it's all good. For me, it was a lot different. So she tried to dye my hair and hair dye works with the color that's in your hair already. It like links to it. So since I don't have any, you it turned no my hair pigment. purple. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, which is not better than white. No. <laughs> So then finally she figured out, we went to a really expensive place, and I was very, we were very poor when I was little. We went to an expensive place where this lady figured out how to make my hair blonde, and I wore these tinted glasses so that they couldn't see that my eyes are red and my eyelashes are white and stuff. And it was kind of weird to like pull a towel off and see myself like look like a standard issue caucasoid. Um, <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, that's, yeah. that's what I would look like if I wasn't an albino, maybe. Um, but it never quite looks right. You know what yeah. I mean? And so basically what happened is that um, I started realizing that I have to go back every couple of weeks because what's growing out of my body is a secret. And what my mother didn't realize, because she didn't have that wealth of experience, yeah. is that to, to have a person change their appearance to become acceptable to the people that are, that are dehumanizing them is one of the worst things you can do for somebody's psyche and for their soul. So it was actually African-American you've got no, woman. You've got no safe place at that point, right? No, because like, yeah. I'm not safe in my body. Yeah. Basically, what I've decided is that they're right about what they say about me. And they get to determine what I am and what my worth is and what I essentially am at my mm -hmm. core. These people have decided that I'm not worthy of them. And by, di by, by trying to appeal to them and ap appease them, I've said, you know, psychically that they're right. So it was an African-American woman that taught me about, uh, she said, you know, Elvis Presley cre cre invented the pompadour because he was trying to look like Muddy Waters. He wanted to be Muddy Waters, the great blues man. He wanted to be Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters' hair... Was a, was a perm and a process because he was trying to look acceptable in a white supremacist environment. You know what I'm saying? Like this, Elvis. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but, so, so you got this weird thing where like, right. you know, all of these different layers of people kind of imitating each other. And she said, James Brown solved all of that with Black is Beautiful. <laughs> Oh, with so, black so is say it loud, I'm yeah. black and I'm proud. So the idea of black is beautiful is what made me learn how I can actually live in the world. And, and you know, what I've said, the reason why so many people love hip hop music and why so many people love black music, because make no mistake, there's no American music that's not black music, rock and roll and country included. Um, and so that is the reality because of the fact that all of us through the process of modernization lost our lineage. So, you know, we, we begin to forget that like, oh yeah, before somebody told me I was white, I used to be German, or I used to be Dutch, or I used to be Greek, or I used to be Albanian, or I used to be, and those things meant something. Mm -hmm. And I, we traded that in for this idea of white. And what the hell does white mean? It just means that you're better than somebody else above them in a totem pole in a white supremacist situation. So what we're having, what's happening is that so many European American people are deciding like, oh, I don't like this white supremacy thing. And I, my heart is not okay with it. But the problem then is who am I after that? Because we don't know who we are. And even right. if we were to know, oh, I'm Polish. If you go to Poland, they have the same iPod and Twitter and, and Facebook and Netflix as everybody else. They're eating McDonald's. You know what I'm saying? Well, so there's no way to really, right. to really re reconnect with what it meant to be a human being. What did you learn from your spit? I haven't got it back yet. Uh, <laughs> but it's, yeah, I mean, you know, it's interesting to, to try to figure that out. But, you know, again, these are, uh, these are the things that inspired you as a kid, those feelings of like, God, I don't, my, even my mother wants me to change from being yeah. who I am naturally. And, and I know from another one of your songs, Pen to Paper, that you had that opportunity to look at the blank page and start writing. And was that when you started imagining rhyming and rapping and being exposed to this kind of music when you were like eight or 10? Or when did that start? Yeah, it really did. And, and so basically, I learned how to navigate the world, this weird modern world. The modern world's weird. Like, it's really weird. Like, never did people not know their lineage. Never did, in the history of the world that I'm aware of, did people think that they were better than their ancestors, smarter than their parents. Like, this is really weird and new. Um, and so... 
one of the ways that I was able to reconnect with what it means to be a human being, and this is really what, what I was saying earlier, is like why we all gravitate towards black culture so much, even though we don't necessarily know how to interact with black people. But we like the culture because it's like, this is a person who has held on to, to some of the essence mm -hmm. of what, it, the missing pieces of humanity mm -hmm. are alive and well. And they're the first human beings in, in, on earth. So that so that means something, you yeah. know. Um, we all came from Africa but, uh, originally, right? Yeah, you got to be careful with stuff like that, though. Yeah, yeah, because then it's easy to be like, "Well, race is actually not real," which is like really fun to say for a white person. Well, no, I mean, because uh, like neither is money. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But like, okay, so race is uh, actually, and I'm not saying that's what you're saying at no, all. I'm, I'm just saying that we have to be, you know, if it was just us talking, like, yes, absolutely, we all came from Africa. The problem is. Uh, that like once you start talking like that, it's like oh, okay, we're all Africans. Race is a made up construct, and so we I, like I just get to float through life now. And I know you, that's never not what you're saying. That's not my thing, but it's also true that that the the opposite thing is is uh, you know to be aware of race as the first thing that you think of when you meet someone or hang around with somebody else is also in some ways limiting too. You know that there's. As a white person who's going to go in, out into the world and meet other people, it's not always the first. And maybe, and it's not because I feel superior. Mm. I feel like I'm more advantage, or because I'm a musician, therefore I'm cooler, or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's just, you know, we're, you know, I do but, but, feel a commonality with. You know, music does that. I think music yeah, brings pe people together in ways where that's the fun. That's the where we connect, not absolutely. not the details. Yeah, but but being aware of those things too is also like. You know, if I if 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 you're aware of the fact that I'm an albino, so that shapes my whole experience. Like experientially, it's extremely real. Yeah. You know what I mean? So like if I know that somebody's like, you know, dad is rich, or if I know that somebody's dad died when they were two, or if I know something about somebody's reality like that. Yeah. So it's not necessarily a, a, a separation thing when we realize that because of the way this society is structured by the owners, the one percent, you know, they structure that stuff. The average common white person didn't decide like, I'm going to yeah. stop being German and I'm going to become white. Like they didn't decide that. Yeah. These are the people that used to have no land and you know what I'm saying? And used to be the, the most oppressed people in Europe. They said, we'll cut you in. They said, we can, instead of European people fighting each other, if we cut the peasants in, then they'll actually go conquer the whole rest of the world for us and we don't have to do anything anymore. And so they came up with this idea of like, white, you're gonna be part of it. You know what I'm saying? You're part of it, don't worry about it. Trust me, it's gonna be amazing. You're gonna be tired of being. So remember, he's an archetype, he's an archetype. He, that's the original white man. He is an archetype of the idea of whiteness is what motivates him. Oh God, that. really? Is that Even true? though he's orange. Wow. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean, I, that doesn't mean uh, I'm his. Does that mean I'm, I belong to him? No. Absolutely not. Yeah, okay. Good. Just checking. Um, I want to say, you know, we've been talking about comfort zone. That was like where we started this whole thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Remember that? Way back then? I heard you saying that when I was standing back there and I was like, shoot, if he, this, 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 this man has no idea. <laughs> No, but I, I feel asked, really comfortable with you. It. No, I no, feel really comfortable with you. We, yeah. we've, we've been through some stuff already. That's right. And it's funny, you know, again, we are, we are the sum of our own experiences. And as you say, we're also the sum of all those experiences that came before us, you know. And, uh, you know, we find ourselves in an unusual place right now where looking at the leadership that you're talking about, that takes us out of our comfort zone, too. There's nothing mm -hmm. comfortable about that. And in some ways, that could be a positive thing, too to wake up a little more, to pay a little more attention. There's a lot more people engaged in paying, uh, you know, understanding what's going on out there than they might if they'd lulled into this thing and there wasn't a lunatic in charge. Uh, that would be tougher, right? Right, yeah. Uh, it's, it's forcing uh, people who, I mean, one of the definitions of privilege, and I think we need a better word for privilege. I don't think privilege communicates quite what we want it to yet. Because the whole thing about privilege is, is whatever, whatever challenges other people have, and it's also because of the fact that it's hyper-competitive. Like if this wasn't a hyper-competitive culture and, and, and society, then privilege wouldn't matter as much. But the fact that we're all competing with each other mm -hmm. means that like if, 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 some, if you have a challenge that I don't have and we were forced to compete whether we want to or not, then I'm gonna have an advantage over you, and, but I didn't do anything to get it. 
I didn't do anything. And, and so when you say privilege to a person, we usually think of the ways that we're not privileged because that's what our mm -hmm. reality is. So when we say privilege to the average like white person, the average white person is not rich and they're not doing great and they're not, you know what I'm saying? So when you say that, a lot of times they're thinking about economic privilege and they're rejecting it completely, you know. Um, but the reality is that like, you know, for people who have not had to think about what it means to be, uh, to not be a, a, a first class citizen in a global uh, empire, which is what white people are. White people are first class citizens in the global empire. So there's a lot of stuff that, that, that white people don't have to think about. And I'm saying my parents are white, if anybody's feeling like, eh, it's okay, calm down. I'm the whitest person here, I can say whatever I want. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, You've really got diplomatic community, man. You can go, you can go into any community and say whatever the hell you want to anybody. Black, white, albino, Muslim. Where, where did you? Where, where did your journey towards Islam? Where did that start? Well, I kind of felt like as a legally blind uh, albino uh, fat rapper that I wasn't an other and enough, and that I wanted to be. You needed uh, to go farther. I wasn't enough yeah. of an outcast. <laughs> So I decided to choose like the most hated right. spiritual and yeah. wisdom tradition in, yeah. in the planet at the moment. Yeah. No. Um, so I, I grew up. I, I know that one of the first books, I mean, tell me if this is true, that the, one of the first books you ever read was the autobiography of Malcolm X. Yeah. Is that true? That's absolutely true. Yeah. Yeah. That's wild. Yeah. KRS-One actually uh, uh, told me to read it. Yeah. KRS-One, one of the greatest MCs of all time. Um, yeah. And... Uh, he actually, I met him when I was, in 1990, I was 13. I'm 39 years old, so don't do, start doing math. Um, I, I, sp I spare you of that. Uh, but when I was 13, KRS-One came to Lansing, Michigan, where I was living, and he gave a lecture. And he, at the question and answer period, I asked him to sign a book that he had put out. Um, and so he brought me on stage, and he signed my book, and he, to he actually told me that I should read the autobiography of Malcolm X. Mm -hmm. And you know, Malcolm has this amazing journey and when he gets to the end of it, you know, he starts to realize, and this is going to be a, like a, a biased plug for Islam right now, okay? Um, so like everybody that's worried that I'm going to do that, this is it, right? <laughs> okay. So basically what Malcolm X, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, Muhammad Ali, Minister Louis Farrakhan, basically what this community of people has tapped into is that by identifying with a, a, with a wisdom tradition and a system of prioritizing life, a spiritual tradition and a religion that predates the modern world, allows a human being to radically reimagine their whole identity in a way that says, you don't get to define me anymore. I existed before you were you. And so Malcolm really believed that, and he taught it, and he was, proof, he was living proof of it, as was Muhammad Ali and so many other people. And... Then he goes and visits Mecca, and he realizes that there are people in Mecca who would be called white in America. They have blonde hair, they have blue eyes, but he's like, these people were my brothers. Like, we ate out of the same dish. If you ever go be around the traditional Muslim societies, it's, the way they treat you will, will, will break your heart with beauty. Like, it will break you. You'll cry. I mean, people, you know, the old people come and feed you, the children kiss your hand. And when I say feed you, I don't mean hand you a plate of food, but like they make a bite at a time and feed it like they try to put it in your mouth. And then when you tell them you're full, they're like, please, you have to eat. You know, if you like anything in their house, they, you, you, it's yours now, you know, without exception. Like you can like their dinner table and they're trying to figure out how to ship it to you. You know what I'm saying? Um, so Malcolm experienced that with people who would in America be called white. And it, it, and, it, and it clicked something in his psyche as well. It was like, oh, white people have gone something through something very similar where they've lost touch and, they, and we've become encapsulated in this modern bubble that we think white is real, like we believe it's real. And people believe that it's what they are before they get a chance to make a decision about what kind of person do I wanna be? Well, I'm white, that's a given. But who said that? And like, mm -hmm. where, where does that come from? And what does it really mean? There's people in Brazil that think they're white. They're the lightest people in Brazil. They come to America, they're not white anymore. Mm -hmm. So what's white? It just means you're at the top of the totem pole. So, um, so basically, Malcolm said, he came back from Hajj in Mecca, and he said, if European people in America would study Islam, it would make them human beings again. So I close the book, and I'm, I'm Muslim. <laughs> 25 years. Yeah. 
Well, what's what's next that you can choose to make yourself even more isolated? It may be only eating certain kinds of vegetables or something like that. Or what, what's the most obscure thing you could do? Vegans, next? like yeah, Ve- I, I, yeah. I saw somebody say vegans the new black. Yeah. As rich as you got to be to be a vegan, I don't know yeah. about that one. <laughs> That's actually a lie. That's actually not true. In case you just tuned in, you're listening to E Town. I'm here with Brother <laughs> Ali. We are on the radio, remember that? The opinions expressed by the bald man on stage are not necessarily those. Are they? <laughs> Which one? No, I mean, I, 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 you know, you're here for a reason. I know. You know I, I re- and, the, and the beauty of this whole conversation is that, you know, I don't, I don't know your, you know, we met today, but I, I know that we have a lot in common and we have friends in common, mm-hmm. but the, the travel, the journey, the opportunity to, as you say, find out what kind of a person you're going to be, that mm-hmm. begins for all of us. That That's begins right. for all of us as we're becoming aware, becoming awake. And for some people, there's real struggle. For some people, there's real hurdles and thresholds and, and giant oppression and giant obstacles and giant challenges. Absolutely. For others, it's easier, but at, at, there's a lot in common to that struggle. Everybody's got that thing. Everybody's got their big, their big hill that they got to get over. And, and for everybody, whatever your biggest hill is, is the biggest hill in, the, in your world. Right. And that's all that matters. Right. Well, and then you find what you have in common with others, and then you think about your skills, your gifts, and the opportunities you have to lift up your community. Yeah. And that's the journey you're on, that's the journey I'm on, Absolutely. that's everybody here. And this project you have here is incredibly beautiful. Thank you. Really, really amazing. Really, Thanks. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, uh, We are, um, and again, you know, we're, we're, trying to, uh, we're trying to make these connections. We got m- more music coming. We're also gonna talk about uh, some other stuff that's, that's, uh, that's cool. You'll find out more about it later. But um, I want to just mention that before I, I talked about how Atmosphere was here and Ant and Slug uh, kind of introduced us to you. And, uh, and I know Ant was involved with making your newest record, right? Your newest record, by the way, is called All the Beauty in This Whole Life and came out today, right? Yeah. 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 See how you feel after you hear it. Yeah. No, but I think you'll like it. Yeah. I think you'll like it. Well, listen, uh, we've got more music to get to. I, I assume you, you've got, you're 39 years old. Do you have kids? I do. Yeah. I have a 17-year-old son. Yeah. Well, my son will be 17 in a couple of weeks. Yeah. And I have a nine-year-old girl. Yeah. Is your song Dear Black Son? Uh, yeah, that's for my son. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I wrote that song. He and I spent a, a summer together in Oakland. And he's actually named after, there's a, there's a uh, Muslim imam in Oakland named Fahim Shu'aib. And my son's named after him. He basically, his field of study is parenting and masculinity and, and the sensitivity and the, you know, the beauty that's required to really fully be a, a man. You know? And so he was one of my teachers when I was young and um, still remains one of my teachers. Yeah. And so I named my son after him. His mosque is right by Fruitvale Station where Oscar Grant was killed. Oscar Grant obviously is like one of the first people in this kind of like modern wave of young black men being killed by either police or people who wish they were police. Um, and uh, so, you know, that we were together in that place and spending a lot of time there. And so I, re- I wrote that song as both a letter to him. But one of the things that I've learned is that the more I'm able to really identify and pinpoint and communicate my most secret intimate feelings uh, without worrying about whether or not people can identify. So somebody else might not have a black son, but you love somebody that you're worried about and that you care for yeah. and that you can't protect and that you, you know. Um, and so those things, like, like you said, like the way that music and the way that, that these, this type of expression really unites hearts. And that's a universal struggle from, a, from a, a father to a son, but you're talking about the things that he'll be judged for that have nothing to do with him that's or right. the things he's done. Right. Uh, it's a powerful song, as are many on your record. So I, I thought it was a really good record. So th- congratulations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's get back to music. Welcome back to E-Town, Brother Ali. <laughs> 